same mic. Yep. Ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a home interview, Bath, New York. It is the 30th of November 2006. Approximately 6.15 p.m. interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Sure. Uh, Kastner, uh, William K. Uh, date of birth is 9 June 1941. And where? And I was born in Bath, New York. Okay. What was your... Um, Educational background prior to entering service. I was a high school graduate from Harrowing Central School, class of 1959. Okay. Um, <clears throat> did you enlist or were you drafted? Well, the Air Force doesn't have draft. It was okay, I enlisted. Right. Okay. I enlisted. Why did you decide to enlist in the? Um, why did you decide to enlist first of all? Well, the job opportunities weren't around. This area was very good. I did have a job at Taylor Wine. Uh, Fifty dollars a week, uh, but I saw myself going no place. Mm -hmm. uh, clean out wine tubs and stuff like that, just dirty, dirty job. And, and I said, why not? Why not the armed forces? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I sure didn't. <clears throat> I didn't go for the pay purposes because <clears throat> it was seventy-eight dollars a month when I started. However, it was thirty days paid vacation each year. Well. An 18-year-old kid or a 19-year-old kid, you're not too damn smart. That you can get 30 days paid vacation, but with 78 bucks, you ain't gonna take it very far mm -hmm. for 30 days vacation. Uh, but you did get 30 days uh, a year, mm -hmm. so I did join. Yes, I did. Okay, why'd you pick the Air Force? Uh, I don't know. Okay. I I tell you one thing, I wasn't uh, nothing against the Army and Marines. Uh, I sure didn't want to live in a tent. And I uh, didn't, didn't want to dig foxholes, and I sure didn't want to go out to sea for six months and and uh, get seasick. And uh, my last resort <laughs> was the Air Force. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, where did you go for your basic? Uh, everyone went to Lackland Air Force Base in Texas, that I remember. Mm -hmm. What was your basic like? Well, the basic was good. I'll tell you what, I got a pretty good memory, even though I've been sick. Uh, I was in 3701 Squadron, Flight 1093. In fact, my uh, my instructors were Tech Sergeant Flowers, uh, Staff Sergeant Bowman. In fact, and uh, that that them days was eight weeks, and you're you're taught a whole bunch of things, and uh, the biggest fear down there is setback, and uh, they they held that right over your head. If you don't do this, don't do that, then you'll be set back. Mm -hmm. Well, well, let me tell you. We all worked together as a team, because nobody wanted to be set back, because then you start all over again, mm -hmm. and uh, nobody wanted that. But uh, it was ed it was educational, and, and it was I'm glad I was glad it was over, but uh, nothing hard. Mm -hmm. Did you get any specialized training after basic? I went uh, we call it DDA direct duty assignment. I went to uh, uh, Schilling Air Force Base, Kansas, and. Uh, and I was a, a, a security officer. Uh, basically, we had two two sections at that time. We had law enforcement, uh, which dealt with directing traffic and walking kids across the road and direct, and base gate guards stuff like that. And then you had your security, which they would dealt with the flight line, uh, and you provide security for nuclear loaded aircraft, uh, planes that were loaded with fuel for to be on alert, as we call it, and. Uh, well, security was ten times more important. It was a thankless job, but it was ten times more important. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's where I started out at. And then I got my, uh, they relieved us of duty, there was about eight of us, relieved us of duty, and we took our training for two weeks and got our apprenticeship train, uh, apprenticeship level, which jumped us up to three level. In the Air Force, you have uh, 01 level, three level, five level, seven level, nine level. Three level, you're an apprentice. Five level, you're a senior, which means you live need little or no super, supervision. Seven level, you're in the management positions. And nine level, you're in the superintendent positions. Mm -hmm. So that's why they say three, five, seven, <coughs> nine. So I got my three level. Then I went to uh, uh, TDY to Alaska, Almendorf. How long were you at uh, Schilling? 
Come on, click, click, click. Approximately. Oh, no, no, no. I, I don't deal with that. Okay. Uh, November, <laughs> November 1960 to uh, uh, June of 1962. Fact. But it was interesting in Alaska at Elmdorf, uh, I wasn't 21. And, and of course, in Alaska, you had to be 21 to drink. Well, I went to Anchorage. Right? And I took a bus downtown. And, uh, and I, uh, I was hungry, so I went into Woolworths, and they had a snack bar there. It cost me two dollars and twenty-five cents for a hamburger and a small coke. That's ridiculous. Okay, but prices were so darn high up there. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, I walked up and down the Fourth Avenue, which is called the Gut, and I went back to the bus station. I was waiting for the bus to come back. I witnessed the first bank robbery in Alaska as a state, and I tell you exactly, I wasn't football field away. It was a 57 black Ford two-door fact. Saw the driver. I heard, I'm standing there waiting for the bus. Go that way. And they were across down, like I said, down the road on the corner. The bank was on the corner. And uh, I heard the shots. I heard them run out of the bank. I seen a cop come out. He got shot. Went down. I seen him jump in the car. Of course, I hit the deck, naturally. And all of a sudden, I seen him zoom by. But I was the first bank robbery. Hmm. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. I kept my mouth shut too because I got on the bus and went back to the base. <laughs> yeah, I did. But I still got the newspaper article someplace. <laughs> so then I come back from and then uh, Bonnie come out and Janice, my oldest daughter. You didn't explain to them that. Yeah, when, when you were married before you went in? No. Oh, okay. no, I got no. I got married in uh, January of uh, uh, click click sixty one. Yep. I've only been married 46 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Put her in for the Purple Heart. <laughs> and uh, then I got off work one day and, and you always check the bulletin board. And uh, oh, I, oh, I forgot to tell you, yeah, in, in, Can in Kansas, I was middleweight champion of the uh, in boxing. Uh, I tried off the boxing team and I made it. I had the middleweight section, uh, middleweight division, and we had fights. And uh, my always big stand joke that I was a Golden Gloves champion of uh, Oklahoma in 1961. I never fought a guy. He forfeited the fight. So I got the title <laughs> and uh, never fought the guy. And uh, then I went to the Air Force up at, uh, uh, off at Air Force Base, in Nebraska. And uh, we drew straws for inner service, the Navy, Army, Marines. So, well, I drew a Marine. I had to pair off with him, 31 years old. Now, I was about 21. Well, guess who lost the fight? And the war. Me. <laughs> yeah, I did. He beat me to a pulp, boy. He, he, he beat me to a pulp. <laughs> so anyway, I come back, and uh, a little while later, and you know, I got orders to go to Zaragoza, Spain. And uh, so we come home for 30 days. And uh, my brother Fred Cass, who's now deceased, and Dave Englert, they drove me down to McGuire Air Force Base to catch a plane to go out. And this is a true story. So I left all my money home with Bonnie. I said, well, I'm just going to take about $10, 12 with me. I said, because I'm going to get paid when I get to Spain. And she said, okay, hunky-dory. Oh, I don't know how much money it was. And uh, so got down there. And, they, and I had to rent, uh, uh, the plane didn't leave till Sunday. We got down on Friday. Well, I had to stay Friday night and Saturday night. Well, I thought, you know, uh, being a GI, uh, it'd, it'd be free. Oh, no. No, you stay overnight, it costs two bucks a night. Well, I put a dent in my, my treasury in my pocket. And, uh, but I did eat at the base. So, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm standing around, I said, I'll get a couple bucks in my pocket, so I'm going to get paid when I get the bait. Well, I started talking to a man. His name is Sam Lube, uh, Siebert Lewis. We call him Sam. He was with his wife, Chick. They're both re uh, he's retired down in Tampa, Florida. We still stay in touch. He said, where are you at? And I says, uh, where are you at? And he says, uh, Zaragoza. And I said, oh, me too. And I says, uh, what job? And he says, police officer. And he says, so am I. I said, wow. So we were talking, and in them days you carried your finance records right, and you carried it right inside your shirt. Because you lost them, you know, you're dusted. And uh, so anyhow, 
He said, yeah, we won't get paid for about 45 days after, after there. And I didn't say nothing. I only sitting with about a buck and change in my pocket, see. And I said, I got a problem. It's, it's honest, God's truth. We took off McGuire. We got to Torrejon, Spain. Torrejon is uh, Madrid, the capital. And what it is, they basically have planes uh, and they have signs. They had three bases in North Africa. Then you had Marone, which is southern near Seville, and Zaragoza, which was northern. And these, they were milk runs, what it is, they C-47s come in and pick up supplies and mail and stuff like that. We call them milk runs. And anyhow, uh, wait to get our luggage. And uh, you know, and they told us, they says, anyone going to Zaragoza to look for ZAB? Well, no, no brainer, but Zaragoza Air Base. And, uh, and I was right near, the, right, near, right near the door. And all of a sudden, boom, they said, you can pick up your luggage now. And I'm at the door, and I bet I didn't go 10 foot. And you know what I saw on the cement? A brand new $10 bill. It like it come from the mint. I looked down and saw that damn thing. I flipped out. You know what I did? My right foot went on that damn thing. And I said, okay, now people started coming out their double glass doors. <laughs> I said, well, I'm going to get this $10 bill out of the shoe. You know? So I bent down like I was tying my shoe, and I slipped that thing right out. I had me a $10 bill in Madrid, Spain, in a gosh darn airport on cement. Now, that blows my mind. Uh, there is a God. <laughs> and, and finally, when I got paid, I think I had, I had again, less than a dollar in my pocket. Yeah, oh. So I went to Zergos, and then I uh, humped security there. Oh, geez. I could tell you a story of this. Oh, my God. Well, I got promoted there in first class. And that was 1st of October, click, click, 63. And I don't think Bonnie's over there, then. I don't think you were, honey, because you were saving your money to come over because you, we had to pay for you. I there in February 63. Well, maybe you were there. Okay. Yeah, but anyhow, uh, I got promoted, and I was in charge of the alert area. And there was 17 B-47 bombers. That's not true. That's not true. There was 21 B-47 bombers, nuclear loaded. On alert, and you had one guard per three. Then you had uh, six or seven perimeter guards. Anyhow, when I went to work, you went in the Central Security Control. I signed for about 145 million dollars every time I went to work. And I was only a three striper. I've been in the service a little over two years, but that's what I signed for. I signed for the responsibility and the security of all those planes and those nuclear loaded planes, those bombs. Okay, and we didn't think. You just sign your name. So uh, we they, we had we worked shifts over there, and I'll tell you what the shifts were. Day shift was six thirty to two thirty, and you did it for three days, and you got three days off. And you come back, and the swing shift was two thirty to ten thirty. Then you had twenty four hour break, and then midnight shift was ten thirty to six thirty. Then you had a twenty four hour break, and then you started the day shifts. Which was really nice about that because your whole nine day cycle plus your three day break was down there close to a payday. So it worked out good. And you always know when you're going to uh, you know, go to work. You always know when you're going to have your 24 hour breaks. Well, we're on day shifts. And now Mary is soup. I couldn't get sit down breaks. Oh, I got that. And uh, so, but I had to drive around, constantly drive around. But they say every 15 minutes. Well, that's a bunch of crap. They, you know, they turn around just being due bounds. And then, of course, you had to relieve people to go to the bathroom. We were in police series was 10-14. But anyhow, lunchtime comes. They deliver this big, huge box, and I take the, the sack lunches around to the guys. And the guys look right inside and get thrown in the trash can. And this went on, on for a long time. So I says, what's wrong? Because I couldn't eat because I was married. So I, 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 and I was on separation, which is a little different. These guys are single, so they're authorized this brown bag lunch, which was supposed to be a milk, a fruit, and a couple sandwiches to sustain them until they got out until supper time. So I says, uh, stop me. Why are you guys throwing all your, uh, your, you know, your bags in the trash? And he says, have you seen that shit where you have to eat? And he says, no. He says, well, I'll tell you what, you take a look at mine. You open up, and it was supposed to be a ham sandwich, 
It was two slices of fat. There was no mayonnaise, no mustard, no nothing. Slapped together two slices of bread. And if you want to see something else, watch this. You open up the milk, pour it on, it was sour. And the damn apple he got was half rotten. Well, I put it in the bag, and I flipped out, and I turned my vehicle around. Oh, oh I tell you this story. <laughs> Drove right around and got to that entry control point. I said, I'm 10 set. Yeah, the Death Star uh, Combat uh, Security Control, which is only 50, 50 feet away. And he says, 10 for Didn't ask why. And I got out and I walked up. Now, security, now Central Security Control was over here, which handled all the security system. Then we had a base of deputy commander for law enforcement, was a small building here. They Again, they were the gate guards and the traffic patrols and all that type of stuff. Fun escorts. And, uh, but Major Walt Meade was the base deputy commander for law enforcement. And I, I left my post. And I walked over to his office and I walked right in and I made a left. Never forget it, walked right down, stopped and I said, sir, have you got a minute? He looked at me and said, see me in my security uniform. He said, yeah, what can I do for you? And I said, would you eat this? He said, hell no, I wouldn't eat this. And I said, good. I said, coffee cup, I turned around and dumped in his co coffee in the in the trash can and poured that milk. I said, would you drink that? He says, where'd you get this stuff? I said, my troops have been getting this crap for months. And he says, come with me. Ooh -ooh. I'm in trouble now, River City. And uh, got in his staff car, drove up to Chow Hall, got out the back, and I said, I'm in trouble. I am in trouble. I'm going to jail. And got in, and he walked up, and there was a uh, chief warrant officer that was in charge of the whole mess system. And he turned right around, Major Meade. Oh, I'll never forget. I love him. Turned around, and he says, you eat that sandwich. And he said, I ain't that shit. And he turned around and said, then you drink this milk. It's not me. He said, why are you giving it to my men on the flight line? And he said, I am going to have men up here, and they're going to the head of the line every single day, and you will feed them top priority. You will have a special table for them, effective in about 10 minutes. And Major Me walked back out, and he said, I'll see you in front of the base commander tomorrow morning, 0800. And Ed Warren also about flipped. So I drove back. I said, I'm going to jail, Major. I'm going to bail. I said, he says, you're not going to jail. Well, 10 minutes later, sure enough, they come by and said, we're leaving everybody. They went, instead of one man for three, we want one man for six. And relieved the guys, took them up chow so they could have a hot belly chow. And uh, so they go, oh, they were happy. Oh, I was a hero. And a hero, I'm going to jail. So I, and, uh, I, I didn't know what to do. So I got back in my vehicle, I'm going around. And finally, I says, I'm going to jail. And I knew Major Meade called Captain Keith and says, leave him alone. Don't hurt him. Uh, yeah, maybe he was wrong, but he was right. And I said, you should have caught him. And he's right, Captain Keith was an officer in charge of all the security system. He should have known that. See what the men are eating. And uh, I went in after work, and it was Tech Sergeant Peacock was my flight chief. And I said, I want to apologize to you, Sergeant. And you, Captain Keith, I was wrong. I'll take any punishment. But I just, the gong went off, and I saw what the men were eating, and it's been going on for months. I did not know what to do. And I says, I did what I did. And they didn't smile, just they said, okay, thank you, you're dismissed. And then, <laughs> wasn't too long later, a screw up, move up, I uh, was assigned to the investigation section under under Major Meade personally. And that was the fun for it. That was good. Civilian clothes. Uh, I got a quarter's allowance. I had two Spanish lawyers I worked with. I had my own staff car. Oh, boy, it was nice for a young puppy. It was nice. So then I come back in July of 1965, and uh, and Captain Keith rotated at the same time as me, and uh, I got very close friends with the Sergeant Major at Zaragoza, U Santos Jr. Never forget him. And uh, I always give him fake parking tickets, and I just say, "Hi, Sandy, uh, how you doing, buddy? Bill, you know." He thought when he see the parking ticket, he'd always get mad. Oh God, you know. Then he'd see writing for me, and he just laughed like hell because it's uh, the phony ticket. And uh, so we went down there, and Captain Keith came up to me, and they were supposed to board the plane. 
And he says, you like to fly? And I said, no, not really. So I got sleep pills here. He says, let's go take one. He says, he says, it'd be good for about five hours. And uh, I said, okie dokie. So we warm, we drink our, <laughs> took our sleeping pill, come back. Hey, who was it? 20 minutes later, they come over and announce the plane's going to be delayed an hour. <laughs> Captain Keith looked at me and I looked at him and I said, we're in trouble. And I says, cool it, we're not in trouble. So I went up and seen Sandy, Sandy Santos. Going, That's just our problem. It wasn't 10 minutes later. Here's this whole, you're talking 300 people on board this plane. You know, all these seats, three wide. You got a center of aisles, three. Outside are three. You know, a big plane. And uh, says, well, the Kass Sergeant Kastner and family and Captain Keith and family, please report to the front desk. We got escorted out the plane. Picked our own seats. Sat down. <laughs> Sandy said his goodbye. And they said, okie dokie, I said, see you later. And he said, it wasn't 10 minutes later, we were both asleep. Ha <laughs> ha, I'll never forget that. If we hadn't taken our pill until we were getting ready to board, it was a different story. But, oh no, we're going to beat the punch. Yeah, backfired. So I come back and went to K.I. Sawyer, Michigan. And that's a piece of work. K.I. Sawyer, Michigan is so far north you can nosebleed. And if you go outside the main gate at K.I. Sawyer, well, you cross the Mackinac Bridge. And I'll tell you, you can go 100 miles and never see a house. It is pure wilderness. Now, when you cross the bridge, there's a little Mickey Mouse on. You got gas stations there? You best fill up. And if you got a five gallon tank or a 10 gallon tank, you fill that up too. I'll tell you, that's God's country. That's the last of the frontiers, UP. So I didn't know where hell I was going. So I yeah, it was Highway 1, and if we got following. But anyway, if you come out the main gate, it's 23 miles to Marquette. If you want 30 miles, uh, it was an isolated tour. But if, and then on the left was a town called Quinn. And Quinn, if you come around the bend, there was Rosie's Pizza Place. She wasn't noted for her pizzas as much as her cheeseburgers. And I can still taste her cheeseburgers to this day. They're the most delicious. I don't know what kind of meat they use. Maybe it was roadkill. I don't know. But the bottom of it was, they were most delicious. Well, I had, all I had was a cement factory, a bar, and a Mickey Mouse gas station. And a bunch of Indians. And, uh... I don't know the name of the, I don't know the name of the bar, and uh, and I worked in security. Okay, I saw you. And uh, so we always had them. And midnight shift, which we get off at six thirty in the morning. Uh, we uh, whoever had a wild hair would say roll call. Okay, roll call meant that anybody who wanted to, you went off to work, you went down to the bar, you parked your vehicles, went to the back door. Why? Because we knew where the key was. Open it up. Turn on the lights, turn on the jukebox, pop some beers, have some pretzels and candy, play cards, only ones there, yippee ki -yay. but we kept track of everything we spent. And then before we left, we'd be there a couple hours. Then when we left, we cleaned the bathroom, swept the floors, did the ashtrays, lined all of the bottles up in the case, had a little box of the money. He made buku money before he even opened the door at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So he was happy. He loved us. And we never cheated on him, and he said, you know where the key is? Go down there anytime you want to, because I'm going to make money. You know, <laughs> you're talking 60, 70 guys, you know, they drink two or three beers an hour apiece. Hello. You know, and that's not counting the pretzels and the jukebox and the, the bowling machine. So I was there, what, 18 months, and then I went to Barksdale, Louisiana. And I was very blessed. Uh, I was, uh, well, one day, they told me to report to the base commander. All I know is last name. I can't tell you his first name. I know his last name is Moore. Oh, this is another one. This is, this is scary with the military. I'm serious. Yeah. I reported to him, and he had my 201 file. 201 file is your God for you. It's your performance report. It's your history. It's everything pertaining to you. It is gold, because there is only one. And he had it in front of him. And... Uh, and he says, how would you like an opportunity of a lifetime? And I says, sir, I said, I, I don't starve. I says, well, they're looking for a good man in Inspector General Security Division. That's in 2nd Air Force headquarters. I said, not this kid. I'm only a staff sergeant, D5. I only got five years service, six years cap. And, I, and he says, uh, we'd like for you to inter uh, be interviewed by Colonel Hahn and let him make the decision. It's a great opportunity for you, Sergeant Cashman. I says, I says, nothing wrong with that. 
Well, it was an E9 slot, Chief Master Sergeant slot. Chief Master Sergeant's up here, I'm down here. I'm going to fill an E9 slot. Uh -huh. You know, you just don't do things like that. Not your force. So, I wasn't going to ask him how to get there, because that's stupid. So I went out and asked the secretary how to get there. And she told me. This I'll never believe, I'll never forget this. Never. I turned it around and uh, Second Air Force Headquarters at a big three-story building here. The main headquarters, three-story building here, that's where generals were. And the three-story building over the site. And in, in the center here was a parking lot. So I finally found me a parking spot. I got out and walked in, went to the third floor and walked in. And there was uh, a lady, and uh, Mrs. Marks, this was her name. And she says, I've been directed to report to Colonel Hahn. And Colonel Hahn says, uh, come on in, Bill. Mm -hmm. there. So I went in, I saluted, and then turned around to report and misdirected. My 201 file from that base commander's desk was sitting in front of him. And that's the truth. How did it get from Colonel Moore's desk? I saw mine at Colonel Moore's desk. Because he was reading stuff from it. And he got it by a courier and beat me to Colonel Hahn's desk and was laid in front of him. No, I'm sorry, that's that's scary. Made a believer out of me. So we so he sat he said, sit down. So he sat down, he said, We'd like for you to work uh, work with us. I said, Well sir, I'm not smart enough. And I'm, I wasn't. He said, Are you willing to learn? That's the only question he asked. And I said, Oh well, yes, sir. Well I worked with three captains. Let me tell you something. Captain George Toll, Captain Angus P. McIntosh, Captain Gary Allison. George Toll retired as a Fulbright Colonel, in charge of Pentagon security. I worked with him. Never made a decision with his eyes open. Smart son of a bitch. Smart. He was. No personality. He, he loses car keys, loses wallet, loses everything. So finally he gets smart to come in that little plastic bag. I see him in the morning. Morning, Cab. I open the bag like that. He just threw all his car keys and his wallet and his crit. <laughs> check, check what he threw in the bag. I put it in the drawer. Oh yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, Angus P. McIntosh is retired down in uh, Homer, Louisiana. I still get a Christmas card every year from him. Retired top cop colonel, 06, okay, over colonel, in charge of all air training command police work. Gary Allison. Gary Allison retired as an 06 Fulberg colonel in charge of the whole Pacific Theater of Operations police. That's power. And I worked with all three of them as a cat. They fired me every day. You know, I got pictures of my scrapbook. Cass, you're fired. No, uh, well, that's nothing new. But anyhow, <laughs> but anyhow, I was worked there, and then I got a dear John let her go to, to, to Vietnam. And uh, now we're getting into, now we're getting some crap. And uh, you want to shut her off for a second? Thank you. Oh, well, that's in Vietnam. Vietnam. Just coming to Vietnam. Oh, oh Vietnam. Uh, okay, yeah, I got there in Charlie's favorite dartboard. I got there in uh, late August '69, uh, and uh, most cases the squadron was probably at least five to seven hundred people. I'll tell you how how big the squadron was. We're, we're just going to go to a small example. The latrine. You walk in, there was thirty commodes. There was thirty showers. There was thirty urinals. 30 sinks, and there was four of them in our section where we lived. And you hope the hell you could find a toilet that worked. And every day they come, of course, they had to flush them out, you know. Well, you got a lot of guys. And uh, so, anyhow, uh, uh, I was required, I requested to report to Colonel Brock. And what it was that Colonel Shumay, who replaced Colonel Hahn at, at Barksdale, sent a personal letter to Colonel Brock who were buddies and it was telling about me that I also had, which I wasn't aware of, also had an Air Force Commendation Medal coming which I didn't know about. And uh, so he would talk to me and says, what job would you like to do? And I says, and smartest answer I ever gave in my life. Sir, I am here to support you and my loyalty is to you. You tell me and I'll do the job. Well, he had a good job for him. It was a day job. And it was delivering classified material around the base. 
that was not my cup of tea to be a taxi service. It really, really doesn't. So, well, you had your nights off, and you, you know, your weekend, you know. That didn't interest me. You know, um, so I, he saw me one day, and he says, uh, Casper, what's wrong with you? And I says, can I talk to you a minute? He says, yeah. He says, I said, I am bored to death. I says, I'm here to support you, and I said, I'm bored to death. And he says, well, we got an opportunity in intelligence. He says, however, he says, uh, the man rotating, uh, Matt Sergeant West and Captain Jackson, uh, they were going to both rotate me, so would you like to take over as NCOIC of the intelligence section? In the master sergeant position. And I said, well, I'll give it a shot. And he said, well, you got, there's another clause here. He says, uh, you also got to go on flying status. And also you have to have make, based on weather, it's daily recon missions and fly uh, nine special operations squadron uh, in and around the dang air base and uh, look for enemies. Uh -huh. That sounds good to me. Not really, but it's, you know, I didn't know. And uh, so the, I, I had to go get, uh, of course, complete physical. Then they took my fingerprints, of course, and they take elbow prints. And then they take toe prints, heel prints, knee prints. The only thing to do was cheeks my butt. I'm surprised they didn't do that. And uh, then x rays. And. Uh, and you get a physical, it's just, it's just out of this world. And of course, they look for scars and all this stuff. And tattoos, which I don't have any. And uh, so then, what they have in Vietnam, which I think is pretty interesting, is is when you're flying, you have to you have the, the, the wing intel, and there's a card that you fill out. And one of the cards is, for example, they'll say, what's your favorite state? New York. What's your favorite color? Blue. What's your favorite car? Ford. What's your favorite state? New York. What's your favorite meal? Stu. What's your wife's first name? Bonnie. Okay. And every two weeks you had either change or sign off that you validate those. Now why did they have those cards? I'll tell you why they had those cards. Because if you went down, those cards were given to the rescue people. And then they turn around and come up and says, what's your favorite food? Uh, food? And I said, steak. And I said, stew on here. What's your favorite state? And I said, California. They ain't coming in. They ain't coming in. And it makes sense. And you had to do it every two weeks. Revalidate those codes that you had. Basically, to save your life. So, anyhow, uh, they turn around and they gave me two or three missions. Uh, and they were in country. And uh, went out to Nang Bay. Pretty good size. And one day it was Captain Fett that was fine. And he took me out the name, took me up about 3,000 feet and put in a damn spin. And he said, I just got shot, take over. He said, yeah, all right. And uh, so I've been watching him. And uh, so anyhow, I pulled back and turned around, got out. And I, I didn't know if to go left or right. So I went right. And uh, veered right. And then I turned around, made a sharp left. Then I started an incline. Then I leveled off. He looked at me and he says, damn. And uh, so he says, bring her down 1500. I said, okay, okay. So I brought her down 1500. And he says, now we're going to take it in. And I knew the flight path. And he brought it in and you made almost like that. And then he come down and you land, always land from north to south. And uh, they actually had two big runways there. And you want to talk about planes taking off, F-4 Phantoms, fully loaded. Those pilots, God bless. <sighs> God bless fly off and they got everything in there. Oh my God, it's unbelievable. They have all, all my respect in the world. So, but anyhow, I never landed or took off. But I had landing gears down, probably, talked to the tower, did everything except touchdown and take off. And it's, it was a small plane, but the, the whole mission of the, the O2s, uh, and there was only 30 of them using all of Vietnam War, and uh, there was only two flights, A flight was out of Da Nang and B flight was out of Pleiku which was 2nd Corps, and, uh, and, I, I, and I also flew in the Army in the morning, and uh, <laughs> I could have gotten in real big damn trouble there because you're only supposed to have one mission a day, and I was flying with the Army, uh, Black Aces, 21st, uh, I believe, Army Aviation Group, called the Black Aces, in the morning, and then I flew with the 9th Special Operations in the afternoon. and. Uh, that was, uh, uh, warrant officers flew most of the O-1 bird dogs, and they're nuts. They're crazy, but they were good. 
Yeah, they were they were good. I tell you, Mister, they were good. And uh, but the, my pilots that I had out of the 87 mission before I got shot shot up, uh, James Yarbrough was damn near over 50. And I got to know him like a bike I had. Well, I had a mission that morning with the Army. And turn right around. And what you do is you sit down at the desk and they give you a frag order. And you sign for it and you pop the seal and you open it up. And it tells you, okay, this is the map that we want to go in this area in the grid that we want you to go on this mission. And this, they'll give you the ball park time frame. Okay? So, and you can accept it or reject it. You also can reject the pilot. The pilot can also reject you. And it was only happened to me once. Uh, I did, and I, and I did. I said, no, I'm not flying with him. It was Captain Losey. And I, I, Lieutenant Losey, excuse me. I didn't like him. I didn't trust him. I just, I did not feel comfortable. And I said, I'm not going to fly with him. And uh, they aborted the mission. But anyhow, that particular day, that morning, uh, in the Army, the freight order. So that afternoon, I sat down with Jim Yarborough. And uh, then, he, at them days, he was called Fast Eddie. And we popped the freight order, looked down, and it was, this is a piece of cake, we flew it this morning. I said, so I says, uh, we'll, we'll take this one. Jim looked at me kind of funny, he says, are you a little confident, aren't you? And I says, no, I says, I know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, right. So as we signed off for it, so we went pre-flight, and I always help pre-flight. So the pilot always gets in first, because an old two uh, bird dog, you only get, get one the passenger. And he comes in, he's a fan. Ford Air Navigator, he basically does the radio work, he does the, the, the frequencies, and he lines up everything with the pilot, then the pilot can talk to the tower, and then we go from there. And his job was to take off, clear, we call four minute turns over to Nang Bay, then you come in country, and in that four minutes what you're doing is you're looking for free kill zones, and you're also looking where the friendlies are, and we have to plot them on our map. Because we're not going to go in and look down and say, oh, there's a whole bunch of enemies and then crap, you know, they're damn friendly forces. No, you can't do that. Sorry. And uh, so that March 16th, and uh, we took off, and uh, we made a river run. And uh, river runs are very, very, very dangerous. And what it is, you fly real low off the water. The pilot pushes the seat all the way forward. The fan, me, pushes my seat all the way back. And very little or no talking. And we'll pick at this. We're going to go 6 miles, 10 miles, 15 miles. And what it is, when he starts flying it, he flies at about a 5 degree angle. And the only time I do the talking, he don't do the talking. He just flies a damn plane. And what we're doing, you know what we're looking for? Spider holes. An average person tell you from Vietnam can't tell you what a spider hole is. Well, I know what a spider hole is because the iron MVAs will come down and they dig out the side banks of these rivers. They make a hole. Then they come down with the sand pans, put the rockets and the ammunition and, and stuff like that, and then they go down with buckets underneath the water and bring up the soot and the mud, and then they plaster it. Well, it dries, but they know where it's at. Well, you take dry and you see wet it will stick out. And that's my job, to spot those spider holes. And uh, so we, we go, and then he go up and he make a turn, come back and did, did the opposite, opposite side of the, the bank. And I don't know why we did it so much, because number one, if the base is over here, spider holes are going to be on this side. Why? Over here like this. If, if the, the barrage of rockets, they wouldn't be over on the other side. We still make both sides. And uh, so we got finished with that, and we were flying around, and normally our frag orders go, hell, they go two hours, two and a half hours. Uh, we don't keep track of time. And uh, so finally, I, I kept, kept flying around, and uh, Rocky says, uh, no, Fast said, he says, uh, what's the matter? And I says, there's something in the patch down there, and I said, I don't like it. I says, let's, can we take a, a low dive for it? And... Uh, I think they call it California Run. California Run basically goes less than treetop. And that's scary. Let me tell you, it's scary. And you're in a free kill zone in the area. It's scary. So we turn around and come around. And <laughs> he come down all right. And I'll tell you one, that plane wasn't any higher than this bar. 
off the ground. And we're behind uh, the, like a hedgerow in the rice paddies. And all of a sudden he went up about 10 feet and then back down. And there they were. NBA regulars. They had to be a damn near company of them, some bitches. Yep. Damn near company of them bastards. And I turn around and says, get out of here. Well, I didn't say I said, shit, get. And we get out of here. And and he, and he started to climb. And uh, I felt the bullet. We felt the bullets hit the plane. And all of the, <laughs> and then it hit me. And I don't know if one of the bullets helped shatter the seatbelt or it was a concussion of the bullets that hit me that I busted that seatbelt. I know two seven. And I had blood all over that windshield. I mean, it was, it was like you slaughtered three chickens, you know, <laughs> and let them go. And uh, I kept looking down, and uh, now a grease pencil and I started writing on the windshield on a plexiglass. And uh, of course, he's already called it a May Day. And uh, well, he's scared to death. He pissed his pants too. And uh, turned around. And he, I don't, he got a rag from some damn place. I don't know where the hell it was, but I know he crammed it over and crammed it over my gut. <coughs> and uh, he kept looking at me. He was white as a sheet. Well, I was worse, you know. And uh, I have no idea why I took my helmet off. I have, I, and that was the most stupidest thing I could ever, ever recall. Uh, why I did that, I don't know. Because I didn't know if the plane would have been hit that much. I never looked out the back, you know, see if there's any smoke or anything like that. You don't have mirrors on the, on the plane to look out. And, uh, and I, in and out of consciousness. But I got, I'm leading up to something. I hope I got plenty of time. Cause I got, how much time we got? We got 20 on here. 20 minutes? So I got more. 20 minutes left? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's no big deal. And, uh, so anyway, we landed. And, uh, then I was, uh, operated on. And, uh, and I opened up my eyes, and I was in a recovery section. And, uh, there was four Vietnamese. And I don't think they were the enemy. I think they're Arvon soldiers. And I remember bed one had no arms or legs. That's a fact. I remember two had one arm and one leg. And I remember three he had no legs but he had two arms. And number four, I don't know what the hell he was a mess. And they were all yip gibbering, you know. And it was three days after, well, the 16th is when I got hit, so it was the 19th when I, uh, I got uh, woke up. And uh, they was come in and I says, I said, what's wrong with those guys? He says, they were in a vehicle and they hit a, a road mine. And I watched all, I watched three of them die. So they dared right in bed. Had no idea what they were saying. Faintest idea. The only one that lived was in bed number two. Now where did the bullet enter that hit you? Hit me. Like David. They come right up through the legs. And I'm like, I'm sitting in the, in, in the seat of the plane right now. Mm -hmm. The bullets come right up through here. Right up through the bowels here, and right up to the diaphragm here. Mm -hmm. One of them come out and hit Jimmy Arborough uh, in his in his shoulder here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, honey, uh, click click, uh, computer room, top shelf, my brown uh, briefcase. Bring the folder out. I want to show the guys after this is all over. I want to show them the picture. Jimmy Arborough sent me pictures of the damaged plane, and you got to see them. Mm -hmm. Seriously. So any, oh, I'm blowing smoke, but you got me in a roll, man. So you were hit twice with two bullets? I think I was five. Five? Yeah. And uh, it just blew me apart. This blew me apart. Christ. But anyhow, uh, after then I went to Cameron Bay. Cameron Bay, I was down there, and uh, I started shaking. I was in bed like that, and of course, my bandage is on me and IVs and all that. I started shaking. And so I asked uh, one of the guys, I walked by, I said, Give me another GI blanket. Put a little blanket on top of me. Still shaking. So I called, and I said, They give me some, uh, it was grapefruit juice. I sucked like I was drinking, sucking, you know, putting gas in the car. Didn't taste nothing. Well, gangrene set in. Hell, I didn't know that. And I went up to 107, 107.2. And they operated on me again. 
Didn't expect me to live whatsoever. And uh, after the operation, he put me on a freeze bed. Freeze bed is not comfortable. It's a bed. You lay there naked, and I mean naked, and there's air conditioner underneath it. And every 20 minutes they flip you, and you can't go to sleep. And there's constantly someone there asking you questions, name, address, phone number, food, units. But you couldn't go to sleep. And finally I asked him one time, you know, I said, you know, is there any way I can have a terry cloth to cover up my privates, you know? You know, if I'm going to die, let me die with a little dignity, you know? And from there, and I said, I don't want to die in this country. Then I went to Cameron Bay, uh-uh, went to Dakota, Japan. Dakota, Japan, uh, I was medevaced out Easter Sunday, went to, uh, uh, Alaska, down to Scott, down to McGuire, then I stayed overnight in McGuire, then a chopper flew me from there to Valley Forge Army Hospital in Pennsylvania. When I got there, I was put on 29A ward. Now, there's a significance of the wards. A through K is one side, L through Z is the other side. The 30th is the morgue. And I was on 29A. <laughs> and then as you get better, they move you up. And finally, when I got discharged, I was on, I believe it was 9, 9A, when I got, when I got discharged. And then, and we can go through, you know, in Seymour Johnson, North Carolina, uh, I was forced to cross train, except, <laughs> they were going to kick me out of the Air Force. How long were you hospitalized? Uh, shit, from uh, March to probably December of uh, 70. But then I had follow-up rehab uh, with Dr. Uh, uh, S.K. Willis Jr., which in Spain was a major, and we were close friends. And uh, I became a mason because he was worshipful master, and I became a mason under him. And uh, he was now a full bird colonel at Seymour Johnson. And he flew up by chopper to see me at Valley Forge. And he said, Billy, where do you want to go when you get out? And I said, where are you at, sir? And he said, Seymour Johnson. He said, not a bad base. And I said, that's where I want to go. Two weeks I had my orders. <laughs> don't tell me the system don't work. It does. And, uh, <laughs> But S.K. Willis Jr., great guy, he saved his ass and career in Spain, but anyhow, that's a different story. And uh, so then I went that. Then I got a dear John Lilly to go to Ubon, Thailand. And I was there for a year. Then I come back and I was at Chinoot, Illinois. And I run a drug rehab. See, yeah, one of my greatest honors is at Seymour Johnson. They, I crossed, oh, I was going to, I want to stay in the service. And they said, no, you're going to have to get out because you're not. In the Air Force, you have to be mentally, morally, and physically qualified. I wasn't physically qualified to stay in my career field as a police officer. So they were announcing a new career field uh, to help rehab drug, uh, drug abuse people. Well, they sent me to the University of Virginia Medical Center. And I graduated in psychiatric rehab in 1973, I think. And the Air Force footed the bill. And, uh, okay, honey, thank you. And uh, so, if you want to, we can include the photographs in the in the video. Oh, you can. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you hold it up. Okay. Uh, so. Well, we ain't got much time left. Well, we got uh, 14 minutes on here. Left. This is just what I I okay. wrote up for his induction right. for the, mm -hmm. in order to get him into the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Hall of Fame. Is that a copy? Yeah. I better haul ass. But anyhow, I want. Uh, uh, click, click, uh, went in the recruiting service, and then I retired in 1980. But I enjoyed recruiting service. But these are the, <laughs> this is a picture of the plane. That's called, uh, you're, you're yeah, going to have to get back. back. You can focus real Yeah, close those, otherwise it blurs. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell I know? <laughs> Now, what was that plane called? It's called a O2 Cessna. It was called a push and pull prop, which basically means you had a motor in the front, motor in the back. And what it is is when we flew real low, we turned around, we set off one of the motors, and it, and it dropped right down about 60 mile an hour, just like driving a car. And if you need it, you kick the front other other engine on, then you pop right back up to 130 mile an hour, or 130 knots. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. But that's an O2 Cessna. There's only about 32 of them in. Uh, uh, used in Vietnam. This right here, if you look, is called battage, ba uh, battle damage. What is any time a plane comes back and it's damaged, 
they have to turn around and take pictures of it and the card will say uh, the pilot, the date, aircraft number, okay? And uh, and they point to it and then they, they put a band-aid over it, the white piece of tape. Mm -hmm. Because when it goes in a depot, they just look for the white bandages, pull them off and they see where the bullet holes are. Makes sense to me. Yeah, this has one underneath the wing there. I could have gotten two, but it didn't. No big deal on that one. Yeah, that's Jim Yarborough. That's Rocky. He's the pilot. And I think out of my 87 missions, I was probably uh, 50. And he was here to visit me. He come up from uh, Arlington, uh, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Yep, him and his wife. Yep. Oh, I cried like a baby. All the people. He did not make a career of it. He got out after 12 years. But all the people in service, he, I'm the only one he wanted to find. Only one. Unbelievable. This okay. That's Jimmy there. Now this is what the map looks like. And what it is, they turn it around, and his PSYOPs officer is on the right. And he turns it around, he picks out different squares. And he puts them in the frag and seals it. And turn on so you can accept or reject it. But he's doing some heavy intel from upstairs down and turn on says, This is what we got some problems coming up and we need you to to fly these particular areas. Okay, this is another picture. That's the picture taking us off here. Okay, stand by. This is the one that got me. Or the ones that got me. Believe it or not, he had a picture where the bullets come up through the door and got me and blew me apart. What it was is after I got medevaced out, uh, he got copies of the pictures, mm -hmm. which I didn't know about. And this was another big one here. And uh, yeah, a lot of bullet holes. <laughs> and none of them hit the fuselage, you know, otherwise it would have blown up midair. Mm -hmm. And uh, But he said, I got something for you, I'm going to mail it to you. Oh, I, I went spastic down at the kitchen table. I, mean, I, went, nuts. I went nuts. I went nuts. I've seen those pictures. Never, never thought of it. Never dreamed of. It. But I had a very, very interesting career. So your your last years, how many last, how many years were you a recruiting officer? Uh, four years. Four years. Yeah. Worked out of Hornell, mm -hmm. and then uh, I got promoted to senior master sergeant, <laughs> and uh, then I had took over. I think it was a little over six thousand. Square miles. I had recruiters. I had supervisors in Binghamton, uh, Click Click, uh, Ithaca, Cortland, Elmira, Corning, Hornell. I had a lot of responsibility, uh, but it was worth it because I was home. <laughs> and we just got married in, in a house just up the road, and that's where we lived. And this was Bonnie's mother's house. Yeah, she was telling us. Yeah, that. and when she went to heaven, we inherited the house. And so my, my all my kids graduated from Hamlin, just like Bonnie and I did, and uh, were very happy and very content. And uh, I would have stayed, but I didn't want to. How many years service did you have? Twenty years and some odd days. I went in the eighth, mm -hmm. and retired thirty. So twelve or twenty years, mm -hmm. a little over twenty. But I and I enjoy it, and uh, <laughs> I make a joke about it, especially for young people. When you retire at 38, 39 years of age. And before you draw your first Social Security check, you will get back from the United States government for not working <clears throat> for $370,000 for not working. Mm -hmm. That's incredible if you think about it. For a young person today, the U.S. Armed Forces is the greatest. Starting out $1,200 a month, go to base training. What are you going to use it for? Haircuts and dry cleaning. What are you going to do with the rest of the money? You bank it. Pay off your bills, your credit cards, whatever it may be. You can't beat it for a young person today, and I don't care what branch. I really don't. And but for a young person, my one of my grandson is going to the Air Force Reserves. He is going to the Security Forces. Uh, he'll be out of Niagara Falls, um, New York. I'm very proud of him on that. We've had a uh, few police officers in my family. All Air Force people, believe it or not, in our family have been police officers. Bonnie's dad was a police officer in Bath. And I got his badge. And then myself and uh, Rich Dyer. And then uh, Adam Ornsby. Mm -hmm. That's three. Yep, yep. Everyone's from Tucson. So I think we're closing down. 
and I, <laughs> boy, I tell you what, I don't really hour one to, but I got a motor mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank you for your interview. Oh, geez. thank you. I bet you. <laughs> well, I hope so.